So I don't want to give too much away. Uh, you're about to see the episode for yourself. But Philip, how closely does this resemble what was in your imagination when you were writing this all those years ago? Well, there's a big difference between writing a book and making a television thing because every square millimetre of the screen has to be occupied by something which has to be designed and made and paid for and put up and tried and painted and all that sort of stuff. When, I'm writing a, when you're writing a novel, all you have to do is um, a, few, a few sentences, pick out a palm tree here, a light there, something else, <laughs> and the whole scene's done. You, you do, you know, the readers do the work. So um, in this case, I was uh, extraordinarily pleased and delighted to see what a wonderful job they'd made of this. Um, the most important thing of all is the cast, of course, and uh, I couldn't be more pleased. Um, Jane, how did you persuade Philip to, to let you make his, his books into a TV series? Uh, well, Philip says that um, it was because we, we, I met him in his agent's office and we spoke for, I think it was a, a, a good couple of hours, and Philip always said that it was because I... Um, never mentioned CGI once. I talked only yeah. about story and narrative and character. Um, and I, I think, to be honest, I probably never mentioned CGI once because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, <laughs> and, and just trusted that I would one day find someone as amazing as Russell Dodgson and Framestore and that they would turn story, character and narrative into CGI, which they did. Um, but I'm very grateful that he, after those two hours, let us do it. Um, Daphne, let's talk about uh, your your demon, because as you say, the CGI conversation is a slightly complicated one, because this was done in a very interesting and unique way, and there were puppets involved. Do you want to explain a little bit how that all worked? Well, I mean, when we were filming it, we had puppets, which was a brilliant idea. Hats off. Um, <laughs> And we had the most amazing puppeteers, like Brian, who plays the Golden Monkey, and it really helped us because it wasn't just acting to thin air or a tennis ball or whatever, it was actually acting to something that moved and that had emotion and that had, well, a character because it is our soul. And I think we did a puppet pass, which was where we filmed the puppet and we rehearsed with the puppet and we acted with the puppet. And then he took the puppet out and we remembered the movement of the puppet and what he had done and we just acted remembering it. And I don't know if this that's is... All. Oh, that's all. Yeah. That's <laughs> easy. That's it. I no mean, again... <laughs> this, I don't know if it's okay to say this, but you hadn't read the books, is that right, before, before yes. this? Yes. So <laughs> <laughs> can you tell this room full of people what your first impressions of Lyra were? Well, I mean, obviously the first few pages, she's not, like, the most amazing child ever. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I think what's amazing about Lyra is how she grows up and how she becomes such an amazing young heroine woman figure. <laughs> I, can't, I can't get my words out right now. <laughs> and there are some scary elements in this, given that children will be watching it. How, how frightening do you think it's going to be for, for children and for adults? I think it will be more frightening for adults because they will understand fully what's happening. I think when kids will see it, they will see the adventure element of it and that the lead's a child, because every time I watch a show with a kid in it, I'm like, there's another kid. But then... <laughs> When adults watch it, they'll obviously see the dark side and all of the layers that Philip wrote in it and all of the dark, dark stuff that the kids won't even notice. So speaking of the dark, dark stuff, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to. Um, I feel like we should talk about this as if people haven't read the books, but I also feel like this might be a... Has anyone here not read the books? Is this a... Okay, okay. We won't give away too much. <laughs> But are you, are you ready to become a kind of terrifying villain for a generation of children? I, I haven't really thought about it, but I know that my uh, nieces and nephews will not want me to babysit ever again, <laughs> which is kind of a bonus. So, <laughs> oh my I'm, God. I'm fine with that. Uh, <laughs> and what do you think it is about Mrs. Coulter that's so chilling? Well, there's lots of things. I mean, I think she's... I mean, Philip could answer this as well, but she's such an um, enigmatic woman. You don't really ever understand, quite in the books, why she's doing exactly what she's doing. And it's, she's always unpredictable, I think. You never quite know how she comes into a scene and how she leaves a scene. She's a master manipulator. She knows what people want, and she knows how to get it out of people. Um, and she's determined, so she gets what she wants, or she tries to. And that's really scary to be around. And she has this extraordinary monkey that um, <laughs> is with her in, um, and is incredibly vicious. And 
um, together, they are a kind of formidable pair. So, um, and I think what's so amazing, I mean, we've really loved exploring Mrs. C. She's an extraordinary character and an amazing person to keep delving into because I was saying, like, great female characters that you, or any character, when you can't quite understand them, that, to me, is the most amazing character. Mm. It's like Hedda Gabler. You can never quite understand her. And it's the same with Mrs. Coulter. She's someone that is always you're trying to get at and you don't know. So that's why she's, to me, why she's scary and dangerous and incredibly exciting to play. And Philip, there have been other versions. Uh, there's, uh, there was a version for the National down the road. There's been the radio version. What do you think it is that a television series can do for the stories? Well, quite apart from all the talent and all the, um, the sheer work that's gone into this one, what the, the, the single biggest difference is time. Um, when you make a movie um, of a novel, you have to lose most of it because it's got to be something that's going to last 90 minutes, 100 minutes, something like that. But the great virtue of this form, this long-form television, is precisely that, time. The, the story has time to unfold. You can see the connections develop between the characters. And we've seen this in the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years or so, since The Sopranos, perhaps, this, this, the development of a new kind of form. And it's wonderful to watch, and I'm absolutely thrilled to, to have supplied a story for it. Um, Jane, were there any parts of the books that you thought, hang on a second, how exactly is this going to be filmable? Um, I, I give you the amber spyglass <laughs> on that one. Um, but on uh, Northern Lights and Subtle Knife, it's, I always say that the process of making this was like walking on a tightrope. You've got the vision in front of you, which is the vision of everything that Philip has supplied us, and you get on that tightrope and you never look down. And it's like you crossing that ice bridge um, at, at the end of season one. And, um, and as long as you don't look down, there'll never be anything that fades. But I'm, I'm quite glad that the Amber Spyglass, we, we've got a year to figure out. <laughs> so you have a run up to <laughs> that. Figure that one yeah. out, Philip. Thanks. <laughs> Um, I think that we've heard enough from all of us and I think all that remains is for you guys to enjoy the first episode, to be amongst the first people in the world to enjoy the first episode of His Dark Materials on this enormous screen. So please give the panel a round of applause and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.